So, um, Song of Songs is a story, okay? and, uh, and stories always have seasons. And Song of Songs is about storyline of a bride following the bridegroom. Um, and in, our, in, our, in reference to us, it's really the church following Jesus, or the saints following Jesus. So that's the storyline of Song of Songs. And Song of Songs, because of that reason, it's a storyline, it has different seasons. All story, all life has different seasons. And it's the same with Song of Songs. I'm just really simplifying what, what I've been talking about last two nights. But, um, and part of that journey in, uh, in that uh, bride's Following, bride following Jesus is in, in chapter three. It's really a time when she actually uh, really kind of were too immature and so, too insecure to follow Jesus in one season, and she actually lost him for a while. And she comes back and actually, oh, he comes back and meets him again and enters into another uh, another season of just traveling with him. Okay, and what what God does in, in when we actually fall sometimes, or when we are in weakness, or when we actually have kind of strayed away from the Lord, He doesn't scold us. Does he? he doesn't get angry and say, why did you do that? He, doesn't, he never does that. He never forces anything on, unto us. He always allures us. He always captures us with His beauty, or His love, or His grace, or His forgiveness. And He always uh, uh, allows things to happen. He brings circumstances around our, our lives, or bring someone in our lives to actually speak to us or have something that they see in the nature or whatever it is, maybe even a movie. You know, you've got a movie because you are restless and you, you think, oh yeah, that's right, that's, that's who God is. And you come back and you, know, you read the Bible, whatever it is. God does that, doesn't he? And, and one of the things that he, um, he does in this uh, session uh, in the Song of Songs is that because... He had bridegroom, he invited bride to follow him, and bride was at the moment still immature and insecure. What Jesus does, or bridegroom does in this uh, in this uh, season, is that he explains the gospel, how secure it is, what what he has done on the cross, in, in by resurrecting and all those interceding on the right hand side, how secure our uh, our salvation is by holding on to the gospel. And I, in the, I never thought I would find the storyline of the gospel in the Song of Songs, but it's here. In fact, it's probably better explanation of the gospel journey of uh, someone who is being saved uh, in this Old Testament in the Song of Songs than I have seen anywhere else, actually. So I want to just kind of expound that to you so that uh, uh, that you may actually know that there's a gospel in the Song of Songs. And it's an obvious statement, but uh, it's a matter of discovery. So I want to do that today. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm really simplified where the context of this, uh, <coughs> this passage fits in, uh, in the Song of Songs, but uh, I think that's probably enough for us today to actually go on to, uh, to talk about today, about Song of Songs uh, kind of gospel journey. So let me read uh, chapter 3, verse 6 onwards to, uh, to the end of the chapter. So it says this, Who is this coming up from the desert? I'm using NIV here. Who is this coming up from the, from the desert or wilderness, like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and incense, incense, frankincense, really, literally, made from all the spices of the merchant? Look, or behold, it is Solomon's carriage, escorted by sixty warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared, prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made, there's for himself, but really there's not for. King Solomon made himself the carriage. He made it of wood from Lebanon. Its posts he made of silver, its base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple. Its interior lovingly inlaid uh, for, really, for the daughter of Jerusalem. Come out, you daughters of Zion, and look at the King Solomon wearing the crown. The crown with it. The crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. So, gospel journey or our salvation is not a momentary thing, is it? It's not when, when we believed in Jesus, that was the end of the gospel. Every day is living out in the gospel, isn't it? Yes. Yeah? So, it's a journey. 
just like the journey of Thomas Solomon or of a bride going with a bridegroom. So if you look at from here, verse 6 is really in, in, in the context of Song of Songs, the Holy Spirit is speaking. And what is, what is the most important job that Holy Spirit has on earth? It says in John, I think 15 somewhere. It is to, it is to glorify Jesus. Okay? Yes, He does heal people. He does do all those things. But His primary job is to glorify Jesus. He does those miracles to glorify Jesus. Right? So he's, he, is, he exists to glorify God and, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Right? So, Holy Spirit is speaking here. Who is this coming out of the wilderness? In, like a column or pillar of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and incense, and made from all the spices of the merchant. These are the four things that Jesus did in his life, which I'll explain. And then, he explains the gospel is like a carriage that Solomon made. Okay? And, and, and I'll explain why the gospel is like a carriage. And when King Solomon actually identified a bride who lives far away from the actual palace that he wants to bring the bride to, so she, she'll become my queen, he sends a carriage, right, to actually bring her to himself. Okay. And that is a gospel journey, because there's a wedding day in Revelation 19, right? And the gospel kind of story, as a bride and bridegroom, finishes in the wedding day. You do not become bride after wedding, do you? You become a wife. You become the queen. So the gospel journey of bride and bridegroom is starts when you actually, in our uh, New Testament theological term, it's born again. Those people who actually recognize as, oh, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Yeah. And he is my bridegroom, he's my king, he's my judge, whatever, all those things. And then you journey to discover who, how he leads us and how he, how, discover how he leads us as well as how he operates and who he is continuously. Just like when you actually get married or when you actually know someone, befriend someone, you get to know a little bit more and more and more. And that's a journey of our bride and bridegroom uh, uh, gospel storyline, if you like. Okay? So, at the end it says, <clears throat> Come out, you daughters of Zion, and look, the King Solomon wearing the crown, the crown with his mother, which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding. So the journey is, in this context, is that King Solomon uh, sends the carriage, his own personal carriage, and brings the bride all the way to himself, so that there will be a wedding day where they will celebrate into marriage. That is our gospel story. It is you and I, individually, as well as the whole church, that is the storyline of the gospel. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a journey. It's not a one-off thing. It's not something that you did 10 years ago when you encountered God and you got saved. That's just the beginning of the story of salvation. And that's why Paul uses this language like, you know, um, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And things like, uh, uh, he, uh, Jesus sits on the right hand of his Father and forever intercedes for those who are being saved, he says. Who are being saved. Because it's a whole journey. And, uh, and so on and so on. So there's that, that language. It's a journey. It, it's gospel storyline. It's a journey of, of us with Jesus Christ. Okay? Another word is like discipleship or whatever. You know, Jesus is our Lord, so we actually follow him. So this is that, that journey that is described. And Jesus, or, or Holy Spirit here of uh, the Bible, is teaching us how secure this gospel salvation is. The security does not come from you, it comes from God. Okay? The only way you can uh, let go of the security is when you let go. But you do not determine the security of it, the safety of it. Okay? So I'm going to explain that today. Okay? You ready? Ready yes. for this journey? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so verse 6. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? <clears throat> okay, we're talking about Holy Spirit, talking about Jesus. Okay? So wilderness and then pillar of smoke. When you think about pillar of smoke, what do you think about in the Old Testament? Sorry? Yeah, wilderness, but pillar of smoke? Pillar of in the, uh, Yeah, in the wilderness. Okay, I get it, I get it. I thought you were talking about wilderness. Yeah, so pillar of smoke uh, during the uh, day and uh, pillar of fire at night. So it's talking about the glory of God. Okay? And the, the third one is perfume with myrrh and incense. Myrrh is a uh, very expensive perfume in the, in, the, uh, in the olden days. And what was it used for normally? Or, yeah, bombing, the, the dead, right? 
And, uh, and frankincense is another uh, perfume or an incense that actually is used for the incense is used for burning incense, right? Uh, to symbolize the prayers of the saints. Yeah. So when Jesus was a baby boy, or baby, uh, three wise men brought three things, right? One of them was frankincense, another was myrrh, and gold. Gold, God's character. Uh, myrrh is about death and suffering, and frankincense is intercession. That's symbolic of who Jesus is. Okay, so this is that. And then from uh, made from all the spices of the merchant. Really, there's no word made from that, but just literally with all powders of merchant. And when you think about merchant, you, you talk about purchasing. And Jesus in 10, uh, Mark 10 45 talks about he came, he came to not to be served, but to serve, but to ransom in himself for many, which means he literally gave himself up to purchase us. So this is a kind of merchant story. So let me just explain one by one. So firstly, where do you see the wilderness part in Jesus' life? Story. In the in temptation, exactly the desert, right? Forty days fasting, and he. I don't know. You, Satan probably tempted him more things, but those three things that uh, that is highlighted, maybe towards the end, because it's probably that's when he's most hungry and most thirsty, and so he actually tempts him three things, right? What is the whole point of him overcoming those temptations? It is the very temptation that Adam and Eve could not overcome. So he actually, everything that Jesus does is to restore what has been fallen. So when Jesus and Adam and Eve, all he, they had to do was not to eat the fruit. There probably were thousands of other nice fruits, and yet they were tempted to take that one. I mean, from my thinking, it would be easy not to eat that. Yeah. Okay? But Jesus' temptation was a little bit harder, wasn't it? Yeah. Don't you much think? Harder. Yeah. Much harder. So, I always ask, let me just talk about that a little bit. Three temptations, okay? And its first one is, uh, man does not eat on, eat on, uh, eat, eat. Man does live on bread alone, but every... So, what was the temptation? Turn this stone into bread. Because you're hungry. And um, so the second one is he actually takes him to the highest place and says, jump off because the Psalm 91 says, God will protect you. Okay? And third one is, I'll give you all the kingdom. If you wish. Those three things. People, it's true. He, got, he defeated the temptation by the word. So a lot of people say that. I agree with that. But there's more than that. If the temptation is only defeated by knowledge of the word, then the pastors and theologians will overcome the temptation pattern. Oh. <coughs> but that's, is that true? No. no. So, are you saying that's not wrong? That word of God is not? So what it is, is this. You've got to look at that temptation well. I'm not going to go into too detail on that, but let me just talk about those things. First, temptation of Satan is this. If you are the son of God, mm. if you are the son of God, Okay. Do you know what happened just before that? He got baptized by John. And he says, you are my beloved son, whom I am so pleased with. He actually, God actually told him that you are my son. Okay. And Jesus, uh, the Satan is tempted with that. He said, you are identity. He said, so if you are the son, then show me. If you are the son of God, show me that you are the son. So now what does God, Jesus do? He says, man does not live on bread like that. In other words, my identity is not about eating. My identity is I am the son of God. So he, first temptation is directly at him, Jesus. If you are the son, show me, demonstrate. The second one is this. If you are the son of God... Then sh let your father show you, show himself to be your father by protecting you, if you, even if you jump on him. So he's challenging God directly. Second one. Right. Is he your God? Is he your father? Well, show me. Doesn't the word, word of God say that? The third one is this. I'll give you the, all the kingdom. Why did Jesus come on the earth for? To get all the kingdom back. 
He says, I'll give you an easy path for it, Yoshi Yoshi. Again, it's about God. I did not come here to achieve missions. I came here to worship God. Meaning, I came here to obey God. Mm. Okay. So my mission is not tied with the result. My mission is tied with whether I obey God. Okay. So those three things, it's about knowing who God is and knowing who you are in God. That overcomes all temptation. <coughs> yes, it is through the Word. The Word reveals who God is, reveals who we are. But it is the God Himself, the author behind the Word, that actually, if you know Him, if you experience Him, if you encounter Him, you know who He is, then you will know who you are. And that overcomes things. Yes, it is through the Word. But it's, if you don't check Bible, I say to you, no, you, you really can't do that. It is who, you knowing who you are, knowing who God is, knowing that my whole life vision and ambition, not ambition, vision and purpose and goal is to worship Him. Because the first commandment says to love God with all your heart and mind and soul. That is the way we are, and that's how we actually meant to continue to grow in so that we may actually sometimes overcome temptation. Okay? To able, able to hear, <laughs> you are my beloved son, and my son very pleased. You've got to hear that continuously. Okay? So, that's how he defeated Satan. So he says, <coughs> well, who is this coming from the wilderness? Who is this coming out? I, I always, I, I, I've been meditating on this, you know, in, in Matthew 4, Luke 4, and so when the temptation finishes, he's coming out of wilderness. What was he like? What was he, what was he feeling? What was he in his eyes? And one of the pictures I got was this. I have for myself a bride. This is all for, what is all this for? To have a bride for himself. The whole purpose of creation and redemption was so that the son, my son, may have a bride for himself, a people for himself. Because he's a king. I have overcome what Adam and Eve could not and have fallen. I have restored that. And now I have a bride for myself. Twinkling eyes. Ready to meet his bride. It's going to take a little while, but it's just still. Okay? So it says, uh, like a column of smoke, a pillar of smoke, meaning in glory, he comes out of wilderness. He's not faint. He probably is weak in, in terms of physically, but he is coming out, over, have overcome the temptation of Satan, and he comes out gloriously. Because he comes out, because he has won a victory for the bride. And then he says, perfume with myrrh and incense. He's equipped now to do what? To intercede and to die on the cross. Because that's how he's going to do it. That's his life. Isn't it? That's the whole point of, of submission to the Father. A lot of people think He died on the cross for us. That's true. But the primary reason why Jesus died on the cross is because the Father said, and that's what happened in Gethsemane. If it's possible, take this cup away from me. What's He talking about? Is He talking about us? No, He's talking about the Father. So is there any other way? But I will obey you. The cross is the so, he actually is interceding. And everything that he does is intercession. Not only in on the right hand side of the Father. Yesterday I talked about intercession. Intercession is not primary. It's not about prayer. Okay, intercession is everything that you do standing in the gap between people and the situation and God. Okay, so, evangelism is intercession. If you're actually ministering someone, it is intercession. And if you're praying for someone in the gap, it is intercession. Mm -hmm. And prayer is part of that big intercession. That the biggest intercession that has ha ever happened in the history of time is the cross. Jesus did not pray the cross. He interceded by dying on the cross. That's intercession. So don't just equate intercession as prayer. And so Jesus is not just praying on the right hand side of the Father. He's actually interceding. He's standing in the gap. And he's controlling the universe. Okay, So that he will intervene in your life so that you may grow in maturity and love. So that you will become like Jesus to conform to the likeness of Jesus. Does that make sense? So that is what's what's happening here. Myrrh, which is uh, the suffering and the death, 
and frankincense with intercession. And then he says, made from all the spices of the virgin, he gave everything for us. Okay? I don't think God can give us anything more than what he has already given. Can you prove, can you even say, like, God, prove to me your love. Doesn't matter how you feel. Mm. The, 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 the proof is on the cross. Mm. I mean, it is harder, I know that you all probably have children, it is harder to give your children's life than yours, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Is there anything that you would you know, swap your children for? If I give you a trillion dollars, would you still would you give would you give me your ch child? No. There is no greater love that God has shown than the cross, the Father. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. That's uh, there is no more bigger proof than His love for us. So Jesus has purchased us. He gave himself up for us. God actually purchased us for his son. In all the spice, all that is available in the world, he actually swapped it for that. So can you see how valuable we are? Do you think if there's only one person who will ever be saved in the history of time, do you think Jesus would die for that person? Yes. If there's only one person who will be saved, he still will die for that person. That's how precious we are. So, from here onwards, it talks about how he will protect you in your journey. But there's one thing that he keeps on saying, what well, he doesn't say, he implies it. There's one thing that we have to do. Okay? And I'm going to ask you to repeat that at the end. Okay? So, who is coming? Uh, sorry, that's Holy Spirit showing Jesus. This is who Jesus is. This is what he's done. Right? Now you're on this journey. Let's have a look at what it is. There's two parts of the carriage, isn't it? First one, it's talking more about what happens outside. And the other one, what happens more inside. Interior and exterior. So well, let's have a look at outside. So look, it's Solomon's carriage. Solomon's carriage. Who is Solomon in that time? He's a king. He's not just a king. He's king of Israel that God has appointed. But he is the most wisest and probably one of the most wealthy king in, in the world at that time. Okay? Like, the, the, the gold and silver was so common, it was just on the streets at, mm. at the time. Okay? So, this king has chosen Shulamite in the Song of Song. Shulamite woman as his bride. And he is sending a carriage. Do you think he will send a taxi? <laughs> Do you think he will actually hire a uh, limousine? He would, he said, he sent his own carriage. His, his own carriage. What kind of carriage do you think Solomon would ride on? Like, if, if you are the most, most richest man in the world, what kind of car would you drive at the point in time? Would you drive a Toyota Corolla? <laughs> Maybe, I mean, he's humble. But I'm talking about, you know, the one. Right? He would drive, I don't know, he'd probably take, send a plane or helicopter or something. I don't know. But, it's very expensive and extravagant. And he's saying, I am sending my own carriage, my personal carriage, the very carriage that I am riding on, to you to bring you to myself. Jesus gave his son. Now, God gave his own son. Okay? So that we, he will bring us to his son. Okay? The carriage is the gospel. Carriage is Jesus himself. And he sends the carriage to us. Carriage to God. And what does it say? Escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel. 60 warriors guard that carriage. Okay? And I think it's equivalent to maybe something like angels, okay? ministering spirits. I don't know. But we individually have been invited to come to the palace where king, our king is, to the wedding day. And he has sent this carriage, right? his own carriage, personal carriage, extravagant, beautiful, majestic carriage. And he actually sent his own personal guard 
Solomon is Israeli, or Jew. So he sends his own guy, Israel, the very warriors of Israel. He did not send some uh, merchant soldiers, hired people. He sends his own personal guard to actually protect my guy. So we are in this journey, in this carriage, okay, as a bride, and we are protected continuously. Have you ever thought how sometimes you really die because certain things that happen in your life? Yes. Yeah. What do you think that? Because God values us to journey in our way, to finish the race, mm -hmm. right? to bring us into Him. Right? Sixty mighty warriors. Okay, all of them wearing the sword, all experiencing battle. Not the first cadet that came out of uh, army, but the ones who are already battle hardened. They have already fought a lot of demons and evil spirits. They know what it means to protect someone. Okay? He sends these 60 mighty Israeli, or well, the Jewish Israeli, their own personal guards, and, and to protect the bride with a sword at their side, always ready for battle, experience and battle hardened. Mm. We have angels around us always. Mm. To know that, know that this is the journey that we're on and we are safe. Each with his sword in his side, prepare for the terror of the night. They are ready. Okay? They don't sleep until this mission is done and they're wearing a sword at, his side, at their side all the time, ready. If anybody comes out from the bushes to pounce on the carriage, they are ready to fight them anytime. 60 of them. Okay? Now, what is the job of the bride here? When, at the terror of the night, some gangsters came out, okay, to rob of, of this carriage, what is your job as a bride? You, because you get so scared, you jump off the carriage and run into the bushes. Is that what you're meant to do? <laughs> no, what is your job? Stay in the carriage. You do not get off. The, the, the storyline of the gospel, you do not get off and look at some other gospel, some other means to actually ask for help and, uh, and lean on something else. You go back to Jesus. He is the gospel and you stay with Him. No matter what the situation is. How fearful, how suffering, how difficult... Whatever the circumstances, you stay in the carriage. That's the whole point, and that's called faith in our modern time. Faith is not something that you conjure up. Faith is believing who God is, knowing who God is. And the trust comes from knowing who He is. If I, I just told you this story, right? It makes sense for it to stay in the carriage, isn't it? This is the gospel. <clears throat> God is. And he says, all those people come to me, I will never, ever let them go. This is the gospel. All right? The next section about the carriage is this, about the interior, isn't it? King Solomon made himself the carriage. He, it wasn't just a Mercedes Benz, it was his own design car. Okay? Probably have you know, 10 inch thick bulletproof. <laughs> like the president, they actually make their own cars, don't they? Yeah. So there, it's made by himself. In other words, it's, the gospel is himself. I made, I made this happen. It's genuine. It's foolproof. As long as you stay in the carriage. Okay? In the carriage. He made it of wood of Lebanon. Now, why wood of Lebanon? And, and this is. So some, some symbolic or uh, spiritual kind of terms that come out that actually have spiritual meanings. Um, Lebanon trees, Lebanon the tree, sorry, the wood, the trees that came from Lebanon are like cedar and fir. It's a very very hard material. In fact, Solomon built his palace and the temple from these trees. One of the reasons why they use that is because it actually has certain chemicals in it so that insects won't don't, don't actually attack it. Okay? So it's actually long-lasting trees or wood. So what he's saying is this, this carriage, this carriage is about our 
house, if you like, if this carriage is a permanent, eternal thing, okay, this, this carriage will carry you all the way through. It's not going to decay, it's not going to break, it's, it's safe, it's protected and it's solid. Okay. And then it says, <coughs> it's post, he made silver. Silver, he's talking about 30 silver that Jesus uh, really was purchased for in, in for his death, which is talking about redemption. Silver is always talking about redemption in the Bible. So what is made out of it? Post. Why the railway at the side? Rail, uh, railway, rail post at the side. Because when the carriage goes through a bump, what, what do you lean on? You, you hold on to the, the side, the, the bar at the side. So it's really, when, you, when your faith or when, when your life is in shaking mode, you go back to the cross. You say, God still loves me. And I hold on to Jesus and the cross. So when, you, when the, that carriage, sometimes they might go through the bump and, and it shakes and then you actually hold on to the rail bar, the rail bar or the bar, or whatever the post that actually uh, that kind of um, steadies you. And then it's base of gold. Gold is always talking about character. And I'm actually simplifying all the things today. The, the gold is talking about the character. The whole base of the gospel is the nature of God. God is love. Therefore, he says, God so loved the world that he gave his life. He's faithful, isn't he? That's the very character of who he is. Mm -hmm. And so when even when we are faithful, he is still faithful. Yes. And he is what? He's good. Even though we are not so good sometimes, he still will be good to us. Yeah. Okay? Not good does not mean that the way I think it's good, it's the way he believes mm -hmm. is good for us. Okay? And oftentimes what is good for us from God is not the way I like it. <laughs> but it's still good. Okay. And then it says, its seats were upholstered with purple. Purple color? Royalty. Royal. So we are royal. We are prince, princesses okay, of the king. And the queen led royal. And its interior lovingly inlaid. And, and all the daughters of Jerusalem, daughters of Jerusalem are those people who are going to journey with the, with the bridegroom later on, which is Jesus. So what is whole interior thing is this. What do we do while we are in the carriage? Okay. So what do we do in the journey of the gospel is this. We get to know him more and more intimately. Mm -hmm. Everything is designed in there to actually secure us to get to the place where we need to. But while we are in the carriage it is a house of intimacy. It talks about uh, in chapter 1, in the Song of Songs, he has invited us into the king's chamber. To do him, to actually, what do you do in king someone's chamber? If you're a married couple, you don't just have a sexual relationship. What you do really have is intimacy or whispering to one another about our lives. And that is more intimate. Yeah. So this is what happens in the intimacy in the carriage, if you like. So the whole journey is about knowing a little bit more and more and more about my bridegroom, about my father in law, which is God the Father. And the Holy Spirit, how he works. So that John 17, 3 says, This is eternal life that I may know. Or we may know the one and only God the Father and His Son. That is what salvation is. Getting to know God more and more intimately and deeply. That's the journey of the salvation. And as as long as we are in that carriage, which is beautiful, inlaid, lo lovingly inlaid for the journey, you meditate on who God is. You read the Word, you study the Word, you meditate the Word, and you talk to the Holy Spirit, and you encounter Him more and more, and you discover more and more of who He is. And as we do that, we realize, wow, I'm looking forward to the wedding day. When I finally see Him, I will see Him face to face. What a grand day that would be, and that's what it says here. Come out, you daughters of Zion. And Zion is symbolical as Jerusalem, but really it's spiritual. Jerusalem. So come out, you daughters of Zion, and look at the king, look at King Solomon wearing the crown. The crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of the wedding, the day his heart rejoices. It will be the greatest day for the bride, but it will be an even greater day for the bridegroom. Because he's been waiting for this day for literally thousands of years. When he first came out of the wilderness in the pillar of smoke in his glory. And he actually interceding and dying on the cross. 
yeah? And overcoming all things to purchase for, his, for himself a bride. He's been waiting for this wedding day, for this carriage to come. Every carriage that he has sent, his own personal carriage sent to us, until those people all come on that wedding day in Revelation 19. It will be the greatest day, the most, rejoice, rejo uh, most joyful day for both bride and bridegroom. And it says this, look at the King Solomon wearing the crown. The crown which has been given to by his mother. And the mother is talking about the church in uh, Song of Solomon. There is two. Again, I'm talking about the genius of God in the way he wrote Bible. Is this in the Song of Solomon, there's mother is the church. But there is bride's mother, her mother, and uh, and Jesus, bridegroom's mother, his mother. They are a little bit different. They're both church. When God says my church, he knows who he's going to be with him. But when we see church, we see both people who might be saved and not saved. So when he says, the crown with which his mother will crown him, it is those ones who are the true church of God. And on that day, they will all worship him. They will all lay down their crowns like 24 elders before the throne room and say, we are not worthy to receive this crown. You are the crown. And it will be a, a great day of rejoicing. This is the gospel day. This is the gospel journey that we see. And isn't it fantastic? Okay? So, last two, two nights, I, I always finish my preaching and teaching with a, a gospel story. So I want to do that today as well. Okay? Is that okay? So what do you do in the carriage? We stay in the carriage. Okay? Stay in the carriage. That's the motto of the day. Alright? Stay in the carriage. When you're terrified, you don't get out and run into the bush. You stay in the carriage. And while you're stay, uh, staying in the carriage, you meditate on the bridegroom who is beautiful and he'll be glorious when we truly meet him day to day uh, on that wedding day. So we go to Luke, uh, <coughs> Luke 19. It's a story about Zacchaeus. I might have told this story before, but I want to just link it up today with, it, with you. It's about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is an amazing man. Uh, again, the storyline for me is this. While Jesus was alive for 33 years, there hardly there has been there were hardly any people who recognized him as true Messiah or King and worshipped him in the appropriate way. But Zacchaeus was one of them. Okay. And there aren't many. You name you name some. Okay. There aren't many. But Zacchaeus is one of them. And I want to tell you this story. And this is tied in with what I was talking about today about the, the gospel. So he says this, Just Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief, te chief tax collector and was wealthy. He says this, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Was he going to stay in Jericho or not? No. no. Why did he stay the man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was chief test collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being short man, a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I Immediately, I must stay at your house today. This word, I must stay at your house today, it is a, an ingredient day. It is divinely necessary for me to stay at your house. So there's a few places where it talks about this D E I in English. The day is, it is necessary, it is divinely necessary. Okay? I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He is going to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus mm -hmm. stood up and said to me, uh, said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to his house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. The 
because Herod then came to seek and to save what was lost. So let's go through this story. Okay. We always compare Zacchaeus' story with the rich young man, which is in chapter uh, 18, okay? The previous chapter. Rich young men come asking for what to Jesus? Do you know? He's asking for, how do I receive eternal life? Why did Zacchaeus come to Jesus? Yeah, he wanted to see who Jesus was. That's a very big difference. A lot of people come to church to know, to get salvation. But salvation is everything to do with Jesus. Okay. Church is not about salvation. Church is the, it's all about Jesus. Church is a gathering around you. Salvation is by God. If you stick around with Jesus, you will be saved. <laughs> if you have Holy Spirit in you, you have to be saved. Because the Holy Spirit has to go to heaven. And if, you're, if he's in him, then you will go with him. Okay. Salvation <coughs> is not the name of the church. That's what God's name. He will save you. We are all about Jesus. Knowing him, and I just keep on saying 17.3, John 17.3, this is eternal life. What is eternal life? What is salvation? Yeah. It's about knowing him intimately and experiencing him. Okay. So we are all saved people here to get to know him better and to worship him, to honor him. Okay? So rich man came for eternal life and he didn't even get it. You know? He didn't even get it. And this uh, Zacchaeus is also a tax collector. He's a very wealthy man too. But he got it. Because he came to see who Jesus is. It's all about, I want to know who Jesus is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't check on your salvation. Are you saved or not? Ask yourself, do I know Jesus? Mm. Am I getting to know him better every day? That actually proves that you are doing with him. I, am I in the carriage or outside the carriage? Well, if you are actually with Jesus, then you are in the carriage. Okay. So Zacchaeus, he was chief tax collector and was healthy. He wanted, uh, wealthy, sorry. He wanted to see who Jesus was. So what does he do? He's a very short man. He probably was a dwarf. So he was short man. So he <laughs> runs ahead of the of, of the path a path that Jesus would walk, and he climbs up a sycamore tree. And he's hanging over the branch there, and Jesus passes him. And this is kind of a meditation part. So, Jesus, as, as he, Jesus passes, he actually looks up and sees Zacchaeus. Okay. And Zacchaeus gets to see him. And I ask this question, and then I meditate. He says, what was Jesus' eyes like when Zacchaeus looked at him? And what do you think Zacchaeus' eyes were like when Zacchaeus saw Jesus? And straight away Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. How does he know his name? Did someone tell him? Probably not. He knew his name because he was only passing through, but Zacchaeus wanted to know him. And he stops in that town and stays at his house. It is divinely necessary for me to stay at your house because you wanted to know me. Do you think Zacchaeus was happy? He was over the moon. <laughs> so he hurriedly came down and, and prepares a feast, not only for Jesus, but those people who were following him. And people were murmuring and said, Why is this teacher, this Jesus, going to sinner's house, tax collector? And they're murmuring. And Zacchaeus are hearing that. He's a very sensitive guy. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what people are saying. So what does he do? He stands up. Okay? He stands up and says, If I if I have cheated anybody, I'll give him three times, four times more. And I'll give him a halfway to the, to the poor. Is he justifying himself? 
Is he justifying to the people that they're murmuring about him? He's not. Do you know why he, I know that? Because he's not talking to them. Look at what it says. But he has stood, stood up and said to the Lord. He's not talking to the people. He's not just trying to justify what, what he's doing, what they're murmuring about. He's not focused on them at all in this, in this, at this time. Because he came to see who Jesus was. And he's just continually gazing upon Jesus here. True. And saying, I want to know who this guy is. So he's talking to Jesus. And he's looking at his eyes. And he's talking to Jesus, saying, Jesus. He's talking to God. He says, I will give half my wealth away for the poor. And I will give four times what I cheated. Now, this is something that you really need to meditate on because what do you think the eyes of Jesus were like looking at is it this? If you see these eyes, you can give away your wealth. It's true. You give it away. Okay? What do you think? When I was meditating on this, I felt the Lord through his eyes saying to the tears like this. So tears. Do you not have any idea of what you are just doing? Have you any idea the kind of reward that you are going to receive when you enter into the kingdom of God? If you see those eyes, then you will be able to give things away. Zacchaeus was talking to Jesus. And saying, you are worthy. I just saw you briefly, but I know who you are. Mm. Not because in my head I know, but I know in my heart. You are the Lord. You are the King and the Son. You are going to judge the world. You are the reward of those who are worthy. And he is saying these things, and he is met by those gaze from Jesus, saying, do you know the pleasure that I receive from you, Sandra? And do you know the reward that you will bring to us? And, and Jesus has captured his ideas. And he's captured his whole life. And he says, You are worthy to give all the world. looking for eternal life and yet his love money was more important than his eternal life. Perfect, of course, yes. I, yeah, I, I talk about her a lot. Mary of Bethany is my hero. She's the well, first one I'm going to chase after. Yeah, yeah. I talk about her a lot. So this is the key. And today salvation has come. Of course the salvation has come because now he knows who Jesus is. Because he knows the worthiness of Jesus. He knows that he is in this carriage that King Solomon has sent. I am his bride who, are, who is now riding the, the carriage. I can leave everything behind to go to the king in the palace. Yeah? Who actually quoted Psalm 45 today? I, my mouth is like a ready rider. That's Psalm 45. Leave your father's house. Leave your mother's house. Because the king is calling you. That is the gospel. This is the gospel. Okay? It's not some mechanical thing that you believed many times ago that Jesus is my Lord and you say that 10 years ago or something and then, yeah, okay, I'll come to church and just become a religious person. It is not like that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's not gospel. The gospel is relationship with the Father, one and only God, and His Son, Jesus Christ, through the Spirit. So I pray, really, that uh, we will be captivated and fascinated by Jesus in our life, in our journey, in the Gospel, like Zacchaeus did, 
so that we can actually really enjoy the journey. Mm. You know? Then we can know that His leadership is perfect in our lives. Mm. Okay. So let me pray for you guys and for, 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 for myself as well because I always need to be reminded as everybody else also needs to. You know, like in the Old Testament, God always says, remember me. Remember this. Remember this is what I did. Keep on saying. Do not forget. But let us not forget. So Father, this morning we thank you that you have given us the word that so beautifully describes the gospel journey in our lives. And I pray that we will receive this and journey with you in a way that is beautiful. Father, we want to partner with you in this journey where we may be like as close as possible in our lives. Father, I want to know you, encounter you, enjoy you. Father, make a, a journey of this gospel enjoyable one that actually always fascinates our hearts. My words are not adequate to describe who you are in your gospel. But Father, you know, I just ask for that revelation to be had by all the people in this room. That's all I ask for this morning. So I just repeat after you in uh, Ephesians 1, 16 to 19. May the revelation, the spirit of revelation and wisdom fall upon this people so that they may know you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.